Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Conservation Applications in Action session. Um, we have four amazing speakers. Um, again, I'll lay out the ground rules. You have 10 minutes each to talk if you're speaking and then three minutes of Q&A. Um, you can choose to go into your Q&A time if you want. Um, and then answer questions if we have time at the end of the session. So with that, I want to welcome Stephen Brumby, who is at the National Geographic Society. Thank you. Please welcome Steve. You should always hold applause in science talks until you find out if it's any good or not. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm Steve Brumby, National Geographic Society, but we're talking here about a project that actually spans um, three organizations, so National Geographic, um, Google, we'll be working very closely with uh, Tanya and her folks, and World Resources Institute. So, um, okay, so here's, here's, the, here's the problem. Um, we need better global land use land cover maps. There are many applications that would really benefit from land use land cover maps that were good and were updated on a regular schedule. Um, and the current world state of the art um, is the European Space Agency CCI land use land cover maps. There's a time series of these that go up to 2015. They're 300 meters per pixel, which makes them a little bit better spatial resolution than the NASA land use land cover global maps, which are at 500 meters per pixel. Some of them, some categories, some stuff is at 250, but, and, but it's also, quite frankly, it's an older algorithm and, and the land cover categories are maybe not so good as the ESA ones. Also, ESA just released a 100-meter global land use land cover map for 2015. So this is sort of the state of the art. Now, when you look at that 100-meter state of the art map, it turns out that, you know, if, like so here, of course, here's the Bay Area, is the big lobster claw. Um, there's, it's, you're already seeing pixelation at this level, and if you're a local around here, you'll start to notice stuff that doesn't look right, okay? Now, if you are happy, if you are lucky to be a citizen of the United States, you can zoom in further and, and you can use the National Land Cover data set produced by the US Geological Survey using NASA Landsat, NASA slash USGS Landsat data. Um, and that's, that's really pretty good. It's 30 meters per pixel, but it's only available for free for the United States. There's a Chinese national government project product called um, uh, Globe 30, which was a global 30-meter land use land cover for 2000 and 2010 that was released in about 2017, 2018? No, 2016, 2017. Um, it was a major effort. It's global. But the scientific community is still kind of, you know, uh, on the fence about how scientifically correct it is, you know, like how accurate is that map. Um, there's also there's a commercial product at 30 meter called Baseview made by MDA Federal. It's nice, it was made by the US government, for the US government. It costs tens of thousands of dollars per seat if you wanna get access to it in any decent size amount. And it's proprietary, so you can't use it for your own science experiments. You have to just take what you get. Um, and it's closed, people don't know what the methodology is to make it. So a bunch of reasons why it's not ideal, especially for conservation science. I assume that's the wind chimes and I'm not out of my 10 minutes yet. Okay. Um, so. On the other hand, we have this global Sentinel-2 10-meter data. Thank you. Um, this global 10-meter data from the European Space Agency Sentinel-2. Um, and it's global, it's public, it, so it's free, essentially, and it's a time series, so why aren't we using it? We should be make, trying to make a land use land cover map from this data. How do you do that? The way you do that, if you're not the US government and you haven't got rooms full of Air Force people to sit there, or contractors to sit down and make a map, is that you try and use machine learning. And the pieces that you need to do that, you need the images themselves, you need humans to provide examples of what the machine needs to learn. You need a machine learning engine. The machine learning engine produces both the final map, but it also produces a sort of savable instance of the model which can be shared with other scientists and spark other people's research. So those models, which nowadays are almost always made using Keras wrapped around TensorFlow, um, 
uh, can, you know, should be made open so that you can promote re reproducible science and the machine map, this machine generated map should, goes to the applications. So the way we've come together to form this, this partnership to try and do this, to not just talk about it, but to actually go and do it, is that um, you know, Google, Google's the source of the ESA Sentinel-2 satellite imagery. World Resources Institute and Google have been helping to select a, a subset of images from, from Sentinel-2 to use as training data. At National Geographic, we've actually been assembling teams of human experts to, um, to label images, and I'll describe the scale of that in a sec. And then um, Google's taking the lead on, on uh, well, so Google is taking the lead on developing the, the, the machine learning models with some of us machine learning folks who, who happen to be in the NGO space. Um, and Google will use the infrastructure of Google Earth Engine to generate the maps, which will then go to applications by all the teams. Okay. Um, we have a land cover taxonomy. This is a taxonomy that's very similar to a lot of the, basically it's a synthesis of all the different taxonomies people have used. So it's similar to an LCD, it's similar to the MODIS and, and ESA global land use land cover um, uh, taxonomies. It's hierarchical, so we're going to start with tier one and, and work our way towards tier three, but at the moment we're focusing on tier one. And, and I will say that um, in terms of tier one, the, uh, the trees has sort of been done as a single layer. Go look at Global Forest Watch. Water has been sort of done as a single layer. Go look at the Google JRC surface water layers. Um, built up areas has kind of been done. There was an impervious service product from Goddard Space Flight Center a number of years ago for like 2010. Maybe it's been updated to 2015. And the German space program DLR has got a, a 15 meter one based on SAR data. People have done individual ones. Nobody's put it all together, right? And we need to have them all together to be used for what I want to use it for at National Geographic and World Resources Institute. Um, there's actually a picture here. It's not coming up on the projector at the moment. But um, this is a selection of, of some tiles from the set that's selected, European S Space Agency Sentinel-2 over the world. There's 14 major biomes from things like you know, tropical rainforest to savannas to I, you know, tundra and ice and uh, what they call taiga boreal forest and mangroves and stuff. So this is a scattering of different ones. So that's the imagery. And the problem is you need markup. So what we've done is at Nat Geo, we've assembled a team of over 20 human um, experts who, are, who have produced now over 1,000 of these fully labeled, of these densely labeled images with the, using the taxonomy that I presented before. Um, and the humans, the expert humans, we're using their markup to train a crowd, though, they, though the companies nowadays don't like to call them crowds, they call them dedicated workforces. But you have a mercenary, bunch of mercenaries who are not experts, <laughs> who are being trained from the human expert markup to then go and label tens of thousands of images, right? So that at the end of the day, we will have over one billion labeled pixels. For comparison, the best available, publicly available training data set that's currently available is only 300,000 pixels worth of data. So we're going, what is that, 1,000 times? No, more than 1,000 times more data, okay? And, um, and what I can show here in terms of preliminary results is that actually we've, we've using the data coming from the human experts, we've actually already started um, doing some little proofs of principle. So here we're, we're actually showing, and I'll show this in more in the next, but we actually can take the satellite imagery. Now we have the human labels. We can actually train models and we can produce machine maps. Um, here's, here's some super preliminary results with a very, very simple model. I am, you know, like embarrassed to describe how simple this model is, but also as somebody who's been doing machine learning for quite a while, simple models have lots of benefits in terms of robustness. Um, so we have some very, very early preliminary results, but um, the white areas are regions where the humans basically couldn't be, you know, they ran out of time marking up every single pixel or they weren't sure. Um, so one way to, to, to see if the machine is making sense is to look at how the machine is infilling those regions where the humans skipped. And when you compare it to the underlying image, um, in my opinion, this is actually showing some pretty interesting generalization ability already. Those previous two were for North America, this is for South America. And again, it's doing pretty well. I also have to say, this mangrove one on the bottom, the purple color is flooded vegetation, the blue is open, open water. The human experts had a lot of dispute about how exactly to mark this stuff up. Um, and, and it's interesting to see the computer doing a really a solid job of like mimicking the way the humans were marking stuff up. So what do we want to do with this once we have this all at scale? Um, 
what we want, we have three key land use, uh, three key use cases that I'll, I'll, I'll mention and I'll end. So number one is, um, at the moment, thanks to Global Forest Watch, we have the ability to watch deforestation happening on like weekly timescales, thanks to the GLAD alerts that's generated on Google um, by Matt Hansen's team at Maryland. Um, but we should be able to extend this, not just to forestry, but to all sorts of land conversion processes that are contributing to climate change, which is, that's the big reason we care about these land conversion processes. And be able to correlate it, not just with like, land cover loss, you know, tree loss or, um, or like savanna loss in the case of Brazil, but look at like, you know, what does that mean in terms of carbon um, mobilized hope into, the, into, the, into the environment. Um, we can, again, we can diversify, we can generalize from the idea of just a deforestation alert to, to something that's more meaningful like an actual biodiversity habitat alert. So here we're looking at this yellow polygon you might be able to see is an IUCN range extent piece of the range of that giraffe, which is the Rothschild giraffe. It's a subset of, of one of the, one of the, um, one of the giraffe uh, subspecies. And, um, you know, imagine being able to, to show, um, you know, like real impact on weekly or monthly time steps of what's happening and, and generate alerts beyond deforestation. The last one is um, when you have the whole globe at the same scale and you're not just generating this once, but because it's all done in software, you can do it over and over and over again and can get better than annual land use land cover maps at 10 meters per pixel. You can start to look at, and, and because it's a machine, you can actually run it backwards through time too at some point. You can look at the global impacts of biofuel policies. So for example, his, these are to scale. North America, starting in 2005, there were a number of US government policies on biofuels which led to changes in agricultural practices in the United States, which sparked changes in agricultural practices in South America, which are still playing out. Now it's the most recent stuff to do with the Chinese trade war, the US-Chinese trade war, which is triggering additional construction of, of, of soybean production in South America. And, you know, and then you know, it's in the news, but we can reveal these things so that people can't just you know, claim fake news. Um, and so anyway, so that, that's, that's where we want to go with this. It's a, it's a large um, multidisciplinary team that's making this possible. And um, we, we hope to be able to, you know, to, to give frequent reports on how we're making progress with this and, uh, and hope to have results sooner rather than later. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, we have time for maybe one question. Anyone? So I saw that you had the time slider in there. Uh, any other analytical capability within there, like differencing or anything else within the tool eventually? Um, yeah. So, so this is, this is going to be a data set rather than a tool. Okay. And the idea is that the data set, which will be a, so that it'll be like the European Space Agency CCR or like the MODIS global land cover, there'll be a, an annual or better global land series data set that's at 10 meters. And, um, and then we'll leave it up to different, and then we, we're hoping to host that on Google Earth Engine and other platforms so it has wide dissemination, free and public for everybody, so that people can then use their own whatever algorithms they want on it. Thank you. Yeah, and if you have any other questions, please find Steve yeah, or Sam uh, after the talk. <laughs>